Hey everyone, welcome to our channel. Today, we're diving into another unsettling case, this time set in North Carolina, known for its rich history of country blues and Cherokee culture. Despite being a conservative and prosperous state in the northern part of the South Atlantic, North Carolina typically remains quiet in terms of crime, often making headlines for natural challenges like snowstorms, tornadoes, and severe thunderstorms. However, the tranquility of this state was disrupted on April 10, 2019, when 17-year-old Tristan Borles, hailing from a religious and sizable family, unleashed a storm of violence. In Deep Gap, North Carolina, a calm Wednesday evening turned into a nightmare. Emergency services received a distressing call from a young woman reporting a significant amount of blood in her home and three missing family members, her parents and younger brother. Police promptly responded to the call, racing to Deep Gap, just a mile from the Wataga and Wilkes County border. Upon reaching the home, Patrol officers confronted a chilling scene. Blood marked the walkway to the house, staining the mat by the front door, and a haunting blood trail extended up the stairs inside. The gravity of the situation intensified as officers discovered the lifeless body of a man concealed under a hammock outside. Tragically, he bore several stab wounds. Around 10.30 p.m., another distressing revelation unfolded. The family's pickup truck was uncovered, concealed in the woods. Underneath a blanket and bags of mulch, the woman's body lay hidden. This unfolded as a senseless and impulsive domestic tragedy. The victim, Jeffrey Boris, Tristan's father, was born on April 16, 1975. He served as the pastor of the conservative Pist Bible Fellowship Church, a Protestant religious movement rooted in Mennonite traditions. Tristan, raised in an environment emphasizing personal piety, lived under the watchful eye of God. His upbringing centered around a serious and meticulous study of the Bible, moral instruction, and a strict adherence to virtuous values. The family upheld a set of beliefs that discouraged various forms of entertainment, emphasizing charity, missionary work, love for adversaries, and the renunciation of violence. Jeffrey internalized these foundational principles while growing up as the son of Pastor Harry Boris. He blossomed into a kind, loving, and patient young man. During his youth, Jeffrey secured a summer job at the Big Surf Water Park on Lake of the Ozarks in Missouri. It was here that he crossed paths with a charming and meek girl named Tanya Maitrandom, sharing the same age, views, and upbringing. Tanya mirrored Jeffrey's commitment to Christian values, emphasizing patience and humility. Their connection deepened and Tanya, envisioning a future with Jeffrey, presented him with a picture of an elderly couple holding hands, expressing that this would be them one day. Jeffrey's mother, Kathy Brown, fervently prayed for a wife for her son who wholeheartedly loved the Lord, and her prayers seemed answered. The couple married and their family became a living continuation of the values instilled in them. The cherished photo given by Tanya found a place in the family album. Soon, the couple welcomed their first child, a delightful girl named Haler, followed by three more children. The youngest, a son, was named Tristan. Taylor, in particular, became a devoted older sister, extending care, assistance, and support to everyone in the family. Notably, she forged a special friendship with her younger brother, Tristan, making him her best and only companion despite the age disparity. They were inseparable and shared countless moments together. The siblings engaged in various activities together, from playing sports and sharing a fondness for music to pulling pranks on one another. Guided by their Christian beliefs, Jeffrey and Tanya embraced the responsibility of parenting aiming to instill the kingdom of God in their children's hearts. As the Boris family expanded with the passing years, Jeffrey and Tanya felt compelled by their Christian duty to adopt four more boys from an orphanage, adding to the already large family. The household now comprised eight children, Taylor, twins Ka and Alexis, Misery, Al, Stephen, Maiku, and Tristan. 
The family's religious principles dictated certain rules, such as children being prohibited from using cell phones and social networks until a specific age. The upbringing emphasized asceticism in needs and desires. In adherence to their faith, boys were not allowed to date girls until the completion of high school, typically at the age of 18. Bible study and religious activities were mandatory, shaping the children's upbringing. Regardless of whether they were native or adopted, all children received equal attention, care, and affection from their parents. The Boris household under Tanya's loving guidance fostered a harmonious atmosphere. Tanya diligently maintained internal order among the siblings, emphasizing prayer and good deeds. The couple strongly believed in nurturing virtue through their own actions and demonstrating mercy to their children by setting an example. In 2015, Taylor graduated from high school and relocated to Boone to pursue higher education at Appalachian State University. The Boris family continued to navigate life with shared values, love, and a commitment to their religious principles. The departure of his sister, Taylor, deeply affected Tristan, leaving him feeling alone without his closest companion. While Taylor returned home when possible, she now had her own life to lead. Tristan remained bound by the familiar rules and routines he had rebelled against since childhood. Disagreeing with his parents' religious perspectives and frustrated by the absence of a cell phone and the inability to engage with peers on social networks, Tristan found himself increasingly at odds with his family. In December 2017, positive changes occurred in the Boris family's life. They relocated to a new, more spacious house with a large lot in Deep Gap, Watauga County, North Carolina. Situated on a dirt road leading into a wooded area, the new dwelling was closer to Robin, Tanya's mother, and the children's grandmother, residing just under two miles away. This proximity facilitated easy access for support with the youngest children. However, the move also brought changes for Tristan. He had to switch schools and adapt to a new environment. Enrolling in the local high school, he became involved in track and field, while other kids in the family took on roles as counselors at summer camps. Despite the appearance of a harmonious household, trouble brewed over time as Tristan's behavior began to exhibit signs of distress. In 2018, Tristan's struggles escalated as the school insisted on multiple consultations with a psychologist to address anger issues and a lack of impulse control. Despite his initial excellence, especially in school subjects, by 2019, during high school, Tristan encountered increasing difficulties in understanding certain subjects and he lost interest in his studies, becoming late for classes and displaying a general disinterest in learning. His academic decline was accompanied by a shift in behavior. He started putting on headphones during class, appearing absent-minded. Teachers attempted to intervene and offer assistance, but Tristan remained indifferent, showing no inclination to engage or regain interest in his studies. His behavior was not limited to the school environment. At home, he engaged in constant arguments with his parents, particularly about the lack of a cell phone and restricted access to social networks. The desire for independence and access to modern means of communication seemed to fuel the growing tension between Tristan and his family. Evelyn Faith Jackson. The revelations from Tristan's hidden life were exposed on April 10, 2019, when Tanya discovered secret aspects of his activities. Surveillance cameras installed in the barn, where the family kept their goats, captured evidence of Tristan's clandestine actions. Tristan's old cell phone, which he occasionally used without his parents' knowledge, served as an access point. On that day, Tanya, for unknown reasons, took possession of the phone and read through text messages that revealed Tristan engaging in sexual conversations with girls and discussing illegal drugs with Evelyn Faith Jackson. This discovery shed light on a part of Tristan's life that had been concealed from his family, bringing to the forefront concerns about his behavior, involvement with prohibited substances, and intimate relationships. The situation further strained the relationship between Tristan and his mother as she grappled with the shock and disappointment of learning about his hidden activities. On the day of the revelation, 
Tristan was at school when his parents discovered the information on his old phone. Shocked by the findings, his parents reached out to him in a family chat, addressing the details they had uncovered. Simultaneously, Sher King, Tristan's English teacher, contacted Tanya Boris to express concerns about Tristan's grades and behavior. Tanya responded by informing the teacher that she and her husband would pick Tristan up early to discuss these matters. Upon hearing this news, Tristan was taken aback. His parents left their youngest child with his grandmother and headed to the middle school to address the situation. The ride home was marked by a tense silence. Tristan later testified that his mother appeared uneasy, frequently furrowing her brow as she perused his phone. Upon reaching home, a conversation ensued that lasted about an hour and a half. Afterward, Tanya texted her mother, indicating that Tristan was not upset about losing his phone and car keys. She stated that these privileges would be returned once his grades and behavior improved. Tanya also mentioned that she would soon pick up the younger child. The text was sent at 4 o'clock p.m., but it seemed that the conversation continued. According to Tristan, during their discussion, his mother emphasized the importance of excelling in school, maintaining cleanliness in relationships with girls, avoiding the dangers of illegal drugs, and expressing her disapproval of him studying religions other than Christianity. Tristan felt compelled to listen and recognized the need for significant self-correction. In the aftermath of the discovery, Tristan's parents took steps to address his behavior. They even compiled a list of qualities he needed to cultivate to become a better person, emphasizing traits such as compassion and honesty. This list would later be found by the police. At one point during their discussion, Tristan mentioned that his mother approached him from behind, put her arm around his neck, and applied pressure. In a startled reaction, Tristan instinctively jumped up, turned around, and accidentally elbowed her. He claimed that his mother, in response, grabbed what he thought was a pair of scissors and moved toward him. In a state of shock and feeling threatened, Tristan stabbed her, thinking he was defending himself. He then ran to his father for help. Forensic examination later found no evidence on Tristan's neck, suggesting strangulation by his mother. During the trial, the prosecution presented photos of Tanya Boris's neck, taken by the medical examiner, revealing a broken neck bone. In contrast, a psychologist opined during the trial that, in his professional view, Tristan Boris was mentally sane at the time of the crime. However, he suffered from a severely impaired cognitive state, experiencing depersonalization, derealization, and a feeling that events were unreal. Despite the psychologist's opinion, the court and jury disregarded it, viewing Tristan as a skillful manipulator and a socially dangerous individual. According to Tristan, he acted out of a perceived threat to his safety during the encounter with his mother. Tristan found himself in a state of confusion and distress, unable to comprehend the unfolding events. When his father ran away from him, Tristan, perplexed, stabbed his father upon catching up despite begging him for help. He recalled his father picking up a rock, warning him with a Tristan, don't, but believed his father would rather let him be killed than try to harm him. Witnesses in the neighborhood reported hearing loud screams on the Boris property around 5.30 p.m. that Wednesday. After the violent encounter, Tristan returned to the house and vomited, a reaction that the psychologist interpreted as a sign of severe stress rather than cold-blooded calculated murder. Despite this interpretation, the jury disagreed with the psychologist's opinion, as they were presented with forensic medical examiner reports during the trial. Jeffrey B.'s autopsy report documented multiple stab wounds to the left chest and back, slash wounds to the arms and hands, and abrasions to the skull and forehead. Tanya Boris's autopsy report indicated multiple stab wounds to her left chest, back, and arm as well as injuries that may have resulted from the compression of her neck. These findings suggested that the parents were in a defensive position, not attacking Tristan. Nonetheless, the jury's decision did not align with the psychologist's perspective on the nature of Tristan's actions.